So I'm recording now and I'm just about to share with you my screen. And you'll see today we've got to talk about capacitors. So we're going to start with what is a capacitor? Well, it's a device for storing charge. So if we look at this system I've got here, um, got a battery, got a capacitor. Now normally, what I should say is the capacitor uh, symbol is like that. So it's just two horizontal lines or two vertical lines, depending on which way it is in the circuit, denoting the gap in the circuit. Now that gap in the circuit is important because that's where effectively charge stops flowing. But for the purpose of this explanation, I always put that insulation in the middle because of what's going to happen. Okay, so we just start with this principle. Note how the battery and the capacitor are very similar looking symbols. That's deliberate because both actually store charge. Okay, so the idea is that the battery is going to produce positive charges on this plate. Happy with that? And it's going to produce negative charges on this plate. So although we always work our current as going from plus to minus, we, that's conventional current. What's actually happening is negative electrons are flowing from minus to plus. For the purpose of our calculation, we don't care. Okay, so if we look at this, I've got two plates of metal here that are going to allow charge to build up on them. So over time, this bottom plate is going to get a lot of electrons built upon it. And they can't go any further because of this green insulator. And at the same time, this top plate is going to get lots of positive charges building upon it. Welcome, Harry. Okay, so first question. Did you type it in chat or stick your hand up? Stick your hand up if you know the answer and I'll pick someone. There's a good way. What's going to happen? What are we going to create if we have opposite charges a small distance apart from each other? I'll give you a clue. It involves Coulomb's law. Anybody planning on ticking their hand off? Nobody planning on setting their hands up. Everybody's too scared. If we remember Coulomb's law, let me turn that light as well, otherwise it'll annoy me later in the day. If we remember Coulomb's law, it says that the force of attraction between two charged particles is Q1 times Q2 divided by. 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. That's in your formula sheet. 
force of attraction between two charged particles. Okay. So, if we've got two plates of metal a short distance apart with opposite charges on them, we're going to create a force of attraction between those two particles. Does that make sense so far? Or, for ease of this, if that doesn't make sense so far, please indicate. And you can all see my screen, right? I've got a thumbs up from Daniel. Brilliant. Now, here's the cool question. Those charged particles, the writing's a bit small. Um, yes, I keep forgetting you're on little laptop monitors, aren't you? I'm on my big 24. Bye. Well, I'll show you my rig in a minute. You'll, you'll like it. Um, is that any bigger? I'll try and write bigger for you guys. So, what's interesting with this is that force of attraction is there between those two charged parts. So if we put this, these two plates with the insulator in the middle in a circuit with a power supply, each plate's going to build up its charge until you can't get any more charge on it. And it's going to do it effectively at the speed of light. Because those electrons move at the speed of light. What will happen if I then disconnect the battery? I didn't hear that, Charlie. The circuit's closed. Well, no, the circuit's open now. What's going to happen to those charges? What happens is, yep, so they still attract each other, and so the force keeps the charge in place. So the capacitor uses the force of attraction between those charges to hold those charges on the capacitor which means that capacitor will keep that charge there. Then, if we were to put something like a resistor, or actually, not a resistor, um, let's say a motor, little motor, in this circuit, Now there's a path for those electrons to flow. And again, they're going to be attracted to each other. So what we're going to see is that once there's a front of attraction, I must remember to stop doing the line and use the pen. Those positive charges are going to move that way. And at the same time, the negative charges are going to move that way. And the capacitor will discharge. Okay. So, first thing, what we're going to do today, in sort of 20 odd minutes we've got left, is we're going to look at how we determine, 
I'm just going to go out slightly on this again. So we're going to keep this up. That is a bit small. First thing of how can we determine how much charge your capacitor can store? Well, the clue is in the name. Okay. The clue is there in the name. Capacity. Capacity is the measure of the amount something can contain. So the term capacitor comes from capacity. Storing something. Okay. And the capacitance which is in essence a measure of how much charge a capacitor can store as we'll come on and look. Okay. Must have something to do with the physical dimensions of the capacitor. So what I'm going to do is we're going to look at this. I'm going to grab you. I'm going to look at this. Okay, and I'm going to just call that out. But what we're going to do is you guys doing technical drawing yet well we're going to look at it in plan view rather than front view so I'm going to flip that up and we're going to look at the top of it my capacitor from the top generally looks like that and then if I'm being 100% specific in fact, do you want to know, uh, I'm going to find you, the best way to show what a capacitor looks like physically, if we make it, is with one of these. Let me find the right one. There we go. I'm going to bring this in. Do you all know what that is? That is a pink Bassett Slick Chris All Sorts. The pink and white ones do just as good, but I like the pink one because it, it shows that the two sides are the same. So what we have, this is our top plate, the other pink layer is our bottom plate, they are identical, and the licorice is the insulator that separates them. Because without the insulator separating them, what will this force of attraction do? What happened to the balloon when we put it next to the Van de Graaff generator. Can anyone remember? It slowly got attracted and then they touched and the charge went across and the charge transferred. That's no use if we want to store this energy, store this charge. So we need to stop them from touching each other. So the simplest way is to put a physical barrier in the way 
that stops them touching. Okay. That's what the licorice is in our capacitor. Okay, now in reality they get much more technical than this, but that is in essence your capacitor. So the first part of this capacitor is to say excuse me that the plate is generally a square. Okay. So with this square, let's say I'm putting my positive charges on there again. And this is a really bad example, but it, it does what I want it to do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Select them, copy them, paste them. Okay. I then have a plate twice as big. How much charge will fit on that plate? Four times, twi twice as big. You'll see why I'm saying twice as big in a minute. It's four times, I know, but it's we're getting we're getting to the characteristic I want to look at, which is technically twice as big. No, still four times as big. You're right. I'm just going mad. So. How much more charge? Yes, yeah, four times the charge. And I can do that. So it's taken a while for some of your chat messages to amble through. So uh, you just have to, I have to bear with you and you have to bear with me a little bit with these online messages. One, two, three, four. So what affects how much charge we can store. What's the first thing we can say here affects how much charge we can store? cross-sectional area of the plates. And you are right, I was wrong. bigger the plates, the more energy we can store. So we call that A. And cross-sectional area is in metres squared. What's keeping the charge on the plates? So, again, let's, uh, let's come back. Let's assume, again, we've not got our motor. What's stopping this charge from moving like this in the first place. The capacitor. What in the capacitor? Might be giving a little hint right now.
What's holding those charges in place? The force of attraction. How do we make that force of attraction stronger? We reduce the distance between the plates. This is why we can't get very big air capacitors. You can make a capacitor out of air. Um, we used to do one um, in, in class. But you don't get very good values with it. Um, because um, as you start getting large amounts of charges, we found with the Van de Graaff generator, as the metal plates got close to each other, the sparks started jumping across the air. They could jump quite a long distance through air. So you can't get very large capacitors with air because we can't reduce the distance far enough to increase this force of attraction to a point where it's holding large amounts of charge on the um, capacitor. But the second thing that affects distance between the plates and we call that D. One other thing affects how much charge we can store on a capacitor. Now this is going to strange, look a strange statement, but I've deliberately written it that what that is, not what is this, what this is. Okay. Effectively, how much does that material stop charge carriers from moving through? Not resistance but conductance slightly different okay and what we call this material technical name is a dielectric so you'll often see it said as the dielectric strength it's not quite right dielectric strength is something different and we're not going into dielectric strength at your level as far as I can remember. Dielectric posh word for insulator. Okay. How much it stops letting flow we call the dielectrics permittivity. I have used that word before. Where have we used the term permittivity before? This year in our lessons. give you a clue it's on this sheet somewhere that's what I'm asking you guys we've used it before oh it's 
It's not the ability to store electrical charge. It's the ability to conduct electrical charge. It's the ability, it's the amount of charge it permits to flow. We've seen it before because it's related to epsilon naught, which is in that formula at the top of the page. Epsilon naught going to try and write this so you can get the spelling right. Permittivity of free space. Free space we mean a vacuum. Okay, That is in your formula book. 8.86, 8.85 8 times 10 to the minus 12 Our capacitors then have a relative permittivity relative to that permittivity of free space. So I'm just going to bring this image in. I've just googled it just just to show you show you an image. Here's some basic um, materials and their relative permittivity. You can you can get this one. So you can see air and a vacuum are basically the same thing. Um, we tend to use mica, polystyrene and um, polypropylene capacitors at the school and then if we want really big ones we use what are called um, electrolytic capacitors we'll come on to electrolytic capacitors the biggest relative permittivity I know of is in this one which is barium titanite which is a relative permittivity of 3000 to 8000 you'll see there they call it the dielectric constant it's not, it's the relative permittivity. They are different. Um, they're actually, it's more recognised in this country to use relative permittivity. So, what you'll see is, and this is where we have to be careful, the capacitance C is equal to the permittivity of our material, epsilon, times the cross-sectional area of the plates, A, divided by the distance between the plates, D. And that epsilon that's what's given to you in the exam in your formula sheet, that formula there. That epsilon represents your relative permittivity, sorry, your permittivity of free space multiplied by the relative permittivity which we get off the table when we're designing our capacitor. In the exam, 99% of the time I've read the question if it asks you to work out the capacitance with these values will give you the permittivity okay. but be careful to read it carefully but I was talking about how much charge a capacitor can store and I've not developed that have I? I've developed the capacitance so why is that related to how much charge a capacitor can store? In fact, let me just finish this capacitor. The unit of capacitance 
is the Farad. Named after Sir Michael Faraday, who did a lot of work into storage of charge, etc. But just as part of the explanation, one Farad is the capacitance you get when two um, plates, one metre square, are one metre apart in a vacuum. So that is effectively a cubic metre of space taken up for a one farad capacitor. We don't get one farad very often. Um, I've seen one farad capacitors. They do now appear slightly more frequently now young boys enjoy having great big subwoofers in the boot of their cars I am being slightly stereotypical there but it don't see many girls driving around with big um, subs bouncing off the walls but um, in order to not drain the car battery there's a massive one farad capacitor on them and we tend to work in the nanofarad or microfarad range, which is why I push 10 to the minus 9 nanofarads, 10 to the minus 6 microfarads, and 10 to the minus 3 milli um, as key prefixes to see in exams and to see in questions. Okay, so. charge stored. We already know what charge is. Charge is Q and in coulombs. This is why we build up the capacitance because the charge is directly proportional to the capacitance. And the constant of proportionality is the voltage we have plugged into it. So, just scrolling this down a little bit. Uh, we'll just redraw this quickly. Things always draw faster if you make the sound effects. What we're going to do is just a quick calculation. How are you times tables, kids? Oh, that's not worked so well, has it? Don't get too precious, Mr. Ryan. Or you'll never get this bit done. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me again. It's about the only symptom I've found is I've got this cough. But as you guys are aware, I always have a cough. So it's quite difficult to tell. Right, so let's suggest a capacitance of... Do you want an easy one or a hard one? Hands up for an easy one. <sighs> okay, that looks like it's going to be a hard one. <coughs> so, I'm going to say my capacitance is equal to 400 microfarads and I'm going to say my voltage is equal to 10 volts calculate the charge stored Q 
W equals C times V. Again, that formula is on your formula sheet. Nope. C is capacitance. You should know by now what current is. Don't make me write current. Don't make me write capacitance when I'm saying current. Capacitance. <laughs> Yeah, and that is one of the reasons why current is I, because capacitance had taken the C. Four hundred micro. Times ten. Four thousand. what I was doing then times 10 to the minus 6 which is equal to 4 times 10 to the minus 3 so the charge stored is 4 milli coulombs milli coulomb The only reason that's a hard one is because it's got a prefix in there. To be honest. Okay. So we're going to be capacitors. Obviously, we're going to be moving on. Um, we're going to be looking at um, how they work and how they work together, etc. I want to finish today, so this is the last thing we're going to say. I'm going to come back to this diagram. What would happen to the charge flow if I put a resistor in that circuit? Decrease. What would decrease? But we've already established, in fact, possibly didn't, so let's just clarify. Once these plates are full of charge, the current's going to stop anyway because there's no more charge can go on there, they're full. So it's like a flotation tank. So what would effect would that resistor have on this capacitor filling up with charge? No, it wouldn't decrease the charge. The charge would stay the same. It would decrease the speed at which it charged up. Okay. So adding that resistor This is important for what you're going to do next week. Add in the resistor, slows the rate of charge and discharge. That RC circuit you will see everywhere in electronics. Um, anywhere that has any sort of important electronic equipment that must not ever be switched off will have that sort of system somewhere close to it. What we call an uninterruptible power supply. Okay, so your intensive care machines at a hospital must not ever be switched off for fairly obvious reasons I would hope so if there's a power cut what the heck does the hospital do so they have a UPS in there 
UPS can last probably for up to two hours, two to three hours, something like that. They also have emergency backup generators. The emergency backup generator can take 20 to 30 minutes to come fully online. Some, some new ones can be straight online, but 30 minutes to an hour to be fully charged, maybe on a full up, full app generator for a big hospital. So your UPS, as soon as the power cooks off, your UPS kicks in. Slowly discharges the capacitor that's been charging up while the power's on. Through the system, keeping ev all essential electrical things on until the backup generator kicks in and can start powering them and then it will power the UPS up again. Okay. So UPS are not intended to run things for long, long periods of time. But they are a stopgap between power going off and backup power coming on. Okay. What you're going to do next week is look at that charging system. And then we'll look at how it all pertains to what we're doing in the, in the exam. Okay, that's 11.55. That sounds like a good point for me to stop recording.